Welcome everyone to the first in discussion with event on body image and mental health amongst young people. And a special thank you to Claire Hockey, MSP, Minister for Mental Health, and Moira McKenna, Chief Commissioner, Girl Guiding Scotland. For those of you I haven't already met, I'm Claire Hunter and I'm the founder and director of Red Harbour. Red Harbour are a policy-driven events company focusing exclusively on the issues which affect children and young people in Scotland. We're delighted to have so many attendees from across Scotland here today. I think the level of interest from across professionals in education, child protection, health and beyond demonstrates that there is already some understanding of the importance of body image and mental health amongst our young people. This event is coincidentally timed with in anti-bullying week and the issues discussed today are incredibly relevant. Before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please note that this session is being recorded all videos have been turned off and microphones muted and will remain so for the duration of the session. You will only see the Minister and Moira McKenna. We've received the questions, but if you have any comments or questions, please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen and direct the questions to myself. We will endeavour to ask any additional questions, but we have received quite a few, so unfortunately cannot promise anything. You can remain anonymous, or if you would like, please state your name and organisation in the message. You are also able to email myself, info at redharbour.org, if you have any questions following the event, and we will ensure that they are answered. So without further ado, I would like to pass on to Moira McKenna, Chief Commissioning Commissioner of Girl Guiding Scotland. Thank you, Moira. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me along to take part in today's discussion on mental health and body image. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to speak to you, Minister, about these important issues affecting young people across Scotland and to hear your views. How young people think and feel about their bodies can have a huge impact on their mental health. Already we're seeing the effects of ongoing coronavirus pandemic on how young people are feeling and there is a concern that with increased screen time, many are feeling exposed to more and more images that perpetuate unrealistic standards of beauty, which is causing many to feel negatively about their bodies and how they look. As a GP and a Girl Guiding member, I have seen firsthand how this is affecting girls and young women. Feedback from the recent body image campaign by the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls demonstrates the increased awareness around the physical and mental harms caused by negative body image, particularly in young people. And it's important to remember that this includes boys and young men too. So I'd like to start Minister by asking you some questions. How do you manage your own well-being? I can see from Twitter that you have a new kitten, so this must help. So we can't see the minister, Claire. Oh, there we go. There she is. Here, here, we, we, are. Go. here we are. Here we are. So you have appeared out of the ether. So tell no, me, I, how, do, how do you manage your own well-being? Oh, I think, it, you know, in, in these times, it's it's really difficult, isn't it? Particularly when we're sort of cut off from the sort of social supports that, that we rely on so heavily and probably don't really acknowledge in, in, in normal times. Mm -hmm. um, being able to see friends and family uh, as and when we want to, being able to go out and socialise. Um, and living in the west of Scotland, as I do, we've been under restrictions mm -hmm. for, for quite a few weeks now. So mm -hmm. it can be tricky, but I think, you know, you, you have to, we all have responsibility for our mental health as much as our physical health. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to ensure that you have some downtime, some self care mm -hmm. time some time to do some of the things that you can enjoy mm -hmm. uh, and that are allowed within the restrictions are really important. So making sure that you don't spend all day every day mm -hmm. on emails and work and, and so on and, and computers, mm -hmm. uh, which can be very difficult at times when, when, <laughs> when you're, you're in the midst of a, a pandemic and a health minister. Sure. You mentioned my kitten who's causing me great distress this morning. <laughs> 
who's been <laughs> running about the place uh, as kittens do and has managed to destroy one of uh, my husband's favourite house plants just in the oh, last dear. year. So, <laughs> so I might be going out for a walk sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so there's positives and negatives to having a new kitten. Absolutely. Um, and I hope the positives outweigh the negatives. Oh, definitely. She's a joy. She is an absolute Good. joy. Good. So the evidence of the impact um, of COVID-19 is, is starting to become clear. Um, what mental health issues are becoming particularly apparent as a, as a result of these this year's events? Well, I think if, if I can start on a positive here, Moira, which may not be where you expect me to start. That's okay. But I think since the, the start of lockdown or the start of this pandemic, mm -hmm. we have never spoken so much about mental health as we have. Mm -hmm. Yes. People have been speaking to each other about how are you feeling? And actually, and it's not just that, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. That's a general introduction to, to casual conversations that you might have. But actually listening to each other and checking in with people. And we've, been, we, we've all been encouraging each other as a society to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's giving people permission, if you like, mm -hmm. to say, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. And I think as a society, that has been a real positive that's come out of that, that mm -hmm. people are much more willing to speak about how things are affecting them in a negative way as well as a positive way. Sure. But having said that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we do recognise that, that the, the restrictions and the fears and the worries and the anxieties that we've all been experiencing um, over the last six to eight months have had an effect on our mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we are much more mindful of that. And I hope that, that people have uh, feel a bit more equipped to look after their mental health through some mm -hmm. of the messaging that we've put out through through Scottish Government, through the Clear Your Head campaign, um, through the, the anti-stigma campaigns that, uh, that See Me have led, the it's okay not to be okay message that we've been trying to get out. And you, you may be aware that on October the 8th, we published as a government the Scotland's Mental Health Transition and Recovery Plan. And, and that outlines the Scottish Government's response to the mental health effects that COVID-19 has had. And it's quite a, it's a comprehensive document. It contains over 100 actions. Mm -hmm. um, because we know that the COVID-19 pandemic will have a substantial impact on mental health. Mm -hmm. And we also know that that impact will probably be felt for a long time. Sure. We've been through and are still going through, I think what you could quite easily describe as, as, a, as a national trauma, an international trauma. Um, it's affected all areas of our lives, mm -hmm. um, as I say, socially, but, but also emotionally. We, some of us may be worried about catching the disease. Some mm -hmm. of us may have lived through that or be worried about family and friends becoming unwell some of us have been bereaved okay. um, and so we, we need to be mindful that the, it, this will have an effect on people's mental health and it also has an effect on those who have pre-existing mental health concerns and problems okay um, so what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that children and young people in particular have access to mental health professionals um, when they need them without excessive uh, waiting times um, considering the impact that COVID has, has had, as you've discussed. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's, it's important to, to see at the outset that mental health services have been open right throughout the pandemic. Yeah. So we, we have, the, people have been receiving mental health services, albeit that they, there has been prioritisation of people who are in absolute crisis and who are in, experiencing a, a mental health emergency. And they've also, there's also been access to GPs through that. It may not be through the face-to-face, -face, but GPs have worked right throughout this pandemic um, and provided mental health services as they do day in, day out, right across the country. But, but we do have recognised that obviously it might have a, it, it, it may well have affected people, as I said before, in a, in a different way, mm -hmm. in, in a different way. So um, we have uh, looked at um, expanding services in, in novel ways. So we have uh, expanded our NHS 24 mental health hub so that people can access that 24 seven, and whereas before it worked on, on much smaller hours. Yeah. We've also um, enhanced our uh, cognitive uh, 
behavioural therapy online offering so that people can access those therapies from home. For um, young people too. We, we, those are those are over over eighteen, but when young people isn't isn't no, no. isn't um, young, but <laughs> exactly. And for 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 looking at, at younger people, so supporting um, children and young people. Younger people, we have our I Feel resources on mental health and well-being. That's available via the Young Scots websites yep. and the social media. We expanded um, distress brief interventions mm -hmm. for anyone over sixteen who is presenting in, to frontline services in distress and and who doesn't require a clinical intervention, but might, might require a much more intensive, supportive. Um, mm -hmm practical intervention um, and those have uh, are now available via the NHS 24 website as well okay. uh, not website NHS 24 um, I think it's, it's also important to recognize that, that the, the the pandemic is, has had a quite a unique impact on children and young people through mm -hmm. not being able to to go to school for a long period of time mm -hmm. and perhaps um, struggling with the lack of social support from their friends, but also having to work from home, trying mm -hmm. to do school work, mm -hmm. facing issues of, 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 of everyday life and, and, mm -hmm. and the, um, the impact that they might be worried that that would have on, on their education by not being able to attend yeah. school. So when schools were going back in August, there was certainly a lot of, a lot of thought and a lot of work gone into supporting children's wellbeing. Yeah. So that when they went back to school, it wasn't just about going back to academic um, mm -hmm. endeavours. Um, and you'll be aware that we um, we have also introduced counsellors to our secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And by uh, October, every school would have every high school would have access to a school counsellor. So I think that there are a lot of a lot of levels and a lot of tiers of support being put mm -hmm. in place. But absolutely, accept that we. They, those need to be flexible, adaptable, and we need to look at how things are going forward, particularly yeah. in, in areas where, as we're going into level four in my own area, mm -hmm. and how that's going to affect children's health and, and well-being. Sure. sure. And I work with uh, girls aged 14 to 18, and I absolutely, um, you know, I understand what you're saying because they have really uh, needed that uh, non-academic social support um, out with school to help with their mental health and it's been great getting back meeting them face to face mm. um, and seeing them uh, their mental health improving over time so i've got some uh, questions from um that have been sent in the first one is from lorraine glass from respect me and she asks the mental health of 15 year old girls in scotland has been worsening for some years now and that's from the health behaviors in schools report Bullying, body shaming, abusive relationships and poverty are all gendered issues, often leading to anxiety, depression, eating disorders and self-harm. Do you believe there is scope for specific mental health interventions to be developed for primary age girls to try and stem mental health decline at an early stage? Yeah, so in, in 2019, we published research on the reported worsening of mental health well-being of young women and girls. Um, and the research highlighted, highlighted several interrelated drivers that might contribute to those, those trends. Um, and those included social media use, um, disrupted sleep, uh, body image concerns and, and school related pressures in the the report drove forward key pieces of work. Um, we established an advisory group on healthy body image, um, the publication of Mind Your Time, um, which was world leading guidance on healthy social media use designed by young people for young people. And I think that's really key that we need to ensure that the voice of young people is at the heart of what we do. Um, and the publication of research on the links between screen time and disrupted sleep. Um, Scottish education has a, a key focus on well-being and relationship-based approaches to support children and, and young people. And Education Scotland has established a, a number of resources that can help to deliver the, the key aims of establishing a positive culture and ethos and raise awareness of uh, early adversity and trauma. And in addition, we've convened a, a mental health in schools working group made up of 
sort of key stakeholders with expertise in, in this area. And part of that group's remit is to inform the development of a whole school approach document and professional learning resource for all school staff to provide essential learning uh, that's required to support children and, and young people's mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And those resources are for primary school uh, children as well as secondary school? Yes, the, the, yeah. the resources, as, as far as I'm aware, yeah. okay. um, are, are, are for right across. I mean, I think you get the... If if you if you look at the GIRFIC principles, we're looking mm -hmm. at, at you know at the, the the mental health and well-being of children right from not right mm -hmm. up to 18. Yeah. So, yeah. so while not all of those resources will be relevant mm -hmm. for every age group, sure. um, ensuring that that our, our our young people have access to help and support themselves is really really key, and I think that's one of the 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 absolute drivers behind why we are. Um, aiming to keep schools open yes even when we go into the higher levels of restriction because yes. we recognize how important that is for young people's well-being to be able yeah. to be in school sure um, and um, you know in girl guiding we have our own resources we have think resilient which is mm -hmm. uh, developed and is delivered by um uh, young people to other young people and uh, free being me and they're both peer education resources helping uh, you know girls and young women to feel confident in themselves and uh, with their mental health and to really develop that resilience um, that uh, keeps their mental health um, uh, you know keeps them well uh, yeah. you know when, when they're facing the challenges that they are and especially at the moment. Yeah. And I think or organisations like Gergaiden play, play a key role in that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we were starting to come out of lockdown, mm -hmm. um, the organisations like Girl Guides Scouts and so on were so key to, to being uh, early, uh, early adopters is, is the wrong term, but, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's starting up their groups again because yeah. Of, of the recognition of how important those are to our young people. Yeah. And you, you hit on a, on, on a, a word there, resilience. And I think that mm -hmm. is something that we really do, we really need to try and help our children and young people to develop because that's what's going to help them, not only just through those formative years, but right throughout their lives, having that resilience to cope with adversity because we all are going to have to deal with disappointment, with loss, with grief. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's just life. We, we all have to, we all face that so learning those key skills early is, yes. is really important for them to to be able to develop um yeah. and and have the skills to 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 take on what life throws at you sure absolutely and when they're developed when they're um developed and delivered by other young people it really hits home and uh, the the young people that are a part of those groups really take on board what's being said so it's good Definitely, and, and through in, in in past times when I've uh, we've been able to go and visit places, and, and mm -hmm. uh, particularly in high schools, including uh, high schools in my own area, seeing how they have developed that peer support mm -hmm. work has yes. been um, really um, really encouraging and really empowering for the young people who are delivering that. Absolutely. They're learning life skills too, but also for perhaps if it's if it's a fifth or a sixth year who is the you know the anti-bullying champion or whatever, yes. um, for for other young people to be able to relate to them in a way yes. that that is difficult at that age perhaps to relate to to oldies like me. Sure. Um, so Claire, the next question comes from uh, Chris Mayasitis from Fathers Network, and he asks. Fathers and father figures have historically reported some additional bar barriers to engaging with schools, such as work commitments and a lack of organisational support. And fathers have been less likely to get involved with their children's education than the mothers. During the first lockdown, we saw just not, not just an increase in parents' involvement with their children's learning in general, which hopefully we can build from, but also increased involvement from fathers and father figures and a better understanding of their children's education. Pressures on boys and young men relating to damaging cultural and societal male stereotypes and expectations can have a devastating effect on how they form relationships and, of course, on the mental health of boys and young men. So here comes the question. 
Do you think there is an opportunity for schools to build on this year's increased parental and paternal engagement with children's learnings to help to develop work with parents around positive male role modelling for the benefit of both young boys and young girls? Okay, so I need to declare an interest here as, okay. as, as a mum of boys. So, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> I, 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 I absolutely, I agree with that. I think fathers play an absolute key role in um, modelling and 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 uh, showing how to how to um, how how their sons should behave. You know, like how how they should interact with the world, and 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 in challenging some of those toxic masculinity messages that, that that young boys may be seeing out there whether that be in social media whether that be in peer groups um, and a, and parents play a, a key role in their edu in their child's education and I think that's been even more important during mm -hmm. the COVID-19 period in particularly where young people have been being home educated, he said, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they've been working from home. I, it, I mean, it's vital that schools engage directly with parents and carers and, and foster a positive environment where, where parents and carers are, are involved to, and encouraged to, to work in partnership um, with those parents. Um, the, the transition plan that I spoke of earlier, the Mental Health Transition Recovery Plan, includes actions to, to look at some of those issues, particularly around the impact of toxic um, masculinity, as well as, as men's mental health issues more in general. And I would, I, I would hope that the, what I was saying earlier about we're, we're all a bit more open to, to talking about our mental health. I'm not saying we're all completely open to doing that, but that, that, that would also apply to boys as well. Um, and that they would feel more able to open up about their worries and their stresses mm -hmm. and, and, and their fears too. But mm -hmm. we, I think we, as a society, we have a, we all have a part to play mm -hmm. in, in challenging toxic masculinity and challenging some of those messages that, that, that we might see. And sometimes it, it, it takes someone to say something for you to realise, actually, what I what I heard there or what I saw there was was completely wrong. No, and 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 feeling empowered to be able to say that's not that's actually not true. That's not the right message. <laughs> that, you know, uh, so and that can be that can be a difficult thing to do. Uh, I fully I fully accept that can be a difficult thing to do. But we do all have to play a role within that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next question um, clearly comes from She Scotland and Karen Anderson and Kim Donaghy ask, are the Scottish Government planning on increasing awareness of body dysmorphia, body image and increasing mental health education in our curriculum? And or is there funding to enable third sector organisations to support young people? Okay, so, so I think I spoke earlier again about some of the work that we've we've been doing in terms of um, supporting children and young people to have a healthy or, or, or a good body image. Um, we are committed to ensuring that all children and, and, and young people receive high quality relationships, sexual health and parenthood education. Um, it's, it is for education authorities and schools to decide which resources they use in supporting their teaching. Um, but obviously, the more research that there is into all of these areas, the, the higher that, that comes up in terms of, of a priority and, and issues that people want to discuss. The Education um, Scotland website is a, is a primary source of information for teenagers if, if they wish to teach about issues such as body dysmorphia and, and, and body image. And in addition, the, the National RSHP online resource was published last year and includes content and resources on body image to help teachers to deliver age and stage appropriate lessons. Um, and there, there's a range of funds that Scottish Government administers to support the third sector. Um, those are usually advertised on the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations website um, when they become available for applications. But if that particular organisation is seeking more detailed um, information about funding resources that might be available to them for their particular body mm -hmm. of work, I'm sure if they uh, contact Clear 
um, Claire Hunter, that she'll mm -hmm. be able to point them in the direction of things that are very specific to, to the work that they do. Okay. Thank you, Claire. And I've got a follow-up question. Asa Samaki Roman wonders, what more can be done to embed positive body imagery within education? Um, whether th uh, that be supporting teachers to use resources with images which are more representative of differences in body shape, ability, ethnicity, or even ensuring that it's something specifically built into the curriculum. I think that's something as a society that we need to change. I yeah. don't know we can even just say that specific to skills. Yeah. Um, when we look at, at, you know, most magazines online, Instagram, um, you know, you, you, you don't see a diversity there. Mm -hmm. uh, not that not that I troll the internet uh, looking, you know, like, yes. but, but in general, you don't, you, we don't see a diversity in society. There is very, very much a, 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 um, a almost like a template of, of what you expect someone to look like. Um, but we, we are committed um, to ensuring that children and, and young people receive high quality relationships and sexual health education. Um, Again, it's obviously it's for, for school authorities and, and for um, teachers to, and schools to decide what resources they, they use to support uh, their teaching. Um, but I, I think it's, again, it's important and incumbent on all of us to, to seek that diversity of image and of, of, of mm -hmm. body shape and, 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 and ability and to be more reflective of the society that we actually live in. Mm -hmm. sure. I remember um, many years ago uh, when I was working with a, 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 a support group uh, supporting uh, young mums who were suffering from postnatal depression and, and postnatal anxiety and, and talking to them about some of the images that you see about motherhood. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it strikes me as it's, it's very similar that we only see the perfect image of mm -hmm. the happy mum, the lovely baby that never cries. And so everyone's smiley and, and you know, hair and makeup done and, and lovely dress. And, and most mums know that's not the reality of the situation. Um, that, you know, if you get your face washed in the morning, you're, you're, you're doing well when you've got a newborn. So, you know, we, we know the realities of, of of the world and we, we need to be challenging when, when we're being presented with this is how it is when actually we know it's not. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Diversity and inclusion is so important. Um, indeed, I was on a workshop last night for two hours about it. Um, and, um, you know, body shapes and body imagery is just one of the uh, diverse diversity and inclusion things that we need to be thinking about as well as all the other ones as well. Definitely, definitely, and, yeah. and and challenging that that's uh, the the sort of multimedia image that is put out of this is how society is because we know it's not and 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 as you say that's not just just about you know one particular section it's not about um it, it's not about only about body shape or body image or ethnicity or disability or or whatever um I think we we. As a society, we are starting to see a bit more of that. I, th I think mm -hmm. over recent years, we we do yeah. see we see more of that, and we hear different voices that mm -hmm. we we didn't hear before in in debates of all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, but we we do need to ensure that that at every level of society, that there is more representation of diversity, sure. and that that is that is a big challenge. But yeah. I, it's it's one that we have to we have to keep going at. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important for young people because if they can see it, they can be it. Um, and absolutely. if they can see diversity in um, people who have uh, positions of responsibility throughout society, then they have that um, a better opportunity of thinking that they can manage to achieve that as well. I think you, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head there, Moira. Um, you know, is if you if you can't see it, you can't be it. Yeah. And and so I think all of us uh, who have a have a voice who can mm -hmm. who can influence people have a responsibility to challenge what is what has been seen as the norm sure and, absolutely and make sure that there is diversity right across and i think i think there 
we are very fortunate in the in the young people that, and children that we have across Scotland in that we given an opportunity and I've seen this through the work with Young Scott and so on bring that diversity to to and challenge to the arguments and to the policy so that it is much more reflective of their need sure. and their wants rather than it being a, a top-down approach. Sure. And, and for body imagery, it's really important, isn't it? Because we're, um, you know, the, the the image that you see on social media or um, in newspapers and things is is not the shape that um, that people are. People are all different uh, shapes and sizes, um, and it's really important that young people in particular recognise that, um, mm -hmm. and they're not just seeing that there's there's one particular shape that they have to be. Um, Absolutely, and I think the the, the young people face a challenge that perhaps you and I didn't, that those media images were there. Yep. But the you you perhaps had to go and seek them a bit more than you do now. So yep. they are much if social media is ab absolutely a force for good right across this pandemic in terms of being able to stay in contact with people that we couldn't uh, we we or we wouldn't have been able to do so before. Yep. Um, but, it also, but we also need to ensure that social media is much more reflective of, yeah. of our society and not just that so-called perfect image that, yeah. that then people may feel pressure to yeah. aspire to be. Uh, well, Girl Guiding Scotland did some Girls in Scotland research and it found that three quarters of 11 to 21 year olds um, thought there should be a minimum age of cosmetic procedures of 18. Mm -hmm. 50% um, uh, of 11 to 21 year olds regularly use apps or filters to make photos of themselves look better. 31%, mm -hmm. um, which is almost a third of 11 to 21 year olds don't post photos of themselves unless they've used an app or filter to change their appearance. Um, and 41% um, feel upset that they can't look the way that they do online. So they, they feel, um, you know, they see these pictures and think I can't look like that. And uh -huh. um, so that's, 41%, that's quite high of 11 to 21 year olds. It, it, it certainly is. When was that research done, Moira? Uh, I think that was about two years ago now. So those, some of those figures were uh, gathered. Uh -huh. um, but we've just, there's a new girls uh, attitude survey uh, that has just been published as well. So, but that was our last one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's quite worrying that it's uh, so significant and affects so many young people. Yes. Um, and young, yeah. young women, yeah. yeah absolutely. And as you say, as you said in, 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 in one of your questions, and I think in your introduction, it's, it, this is also about boys too. It's, yeah. it, it isn't entirely, it, whereas it, certainly from the research that I've seen mm. and from what mm. you're there, yeah, certainly seems to be more prevalent in girls. Yeah. It's not exclusive to girls. No, it's not at all. And yeah. I, think, I, think it's, I think it's definitely becoming an issue for boys and young men as well. Mm. Okay, so moving on, because we've got quite a few questions still, and I'm aware of the time. So with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child coming into Scots law, a big part of this involves children, obviously. And I understand that this is happening in schools, but it would be wonderful to see mental health advocates or a buddy system within schools and sports clubs from a young age to encourage early intervention and body positivity. Are there plans in place to develop this or something similar? So the government and NHS Scotland continue to take action through uh, the CME anti-stigma campaign work um, and work to promote mental health and, and, and lifestyle. Um, and that includes positive body images. But as, as a reference to it, uh, in a previous answer, I, I've certainly seen some of those uh, initiatives across schools um, and in young people's organisations or organisations which tend to, to target young people, um, seen, seen that work that that peer support mm. or person that you can you can access as a, as a as the person that you go to who can then help you to get you know see your guidance teacher or, or get additional support, the value that there is there. Um, in that work, absolutely, um, and it seems to to be very warmly received mm -hmm. by young people, but also by teaching staff uh, and leaders of of various youth organisations too. They absolutely see the value in that. I mean, I I was absolutely delighted when when the UNCRC um, 
was it voted passed through so that so it will become um in, into scots law mm -hmm. and i think a, and a big part of that is involving children and young people in decision making yeah. and ensuring that their voice is heard um, when policy is being made when laws are being made um you, you know i I, I know from from my work with with some charities representing a uh, various various sort uh, organisations and disability groups, mm -hmm. and it's it's that nothing about me without me, mm -hmm. and and I think that should that should be our our mantra when it comes to right across mental health, mm -hmm. um, but children and young people too, in in the the wider aspects of their life too that we know. Sure. And let them feel that they're empowered yep. and listen to what they're saying and act on what they're saying. And that that, that is the, the act bit is probably the, the most important part of that. Yes. Because you know, we, you can do all the focus groups in the world that you like yep. and all the research that you like. Yep. But if there's not an actual outcome from that, if people can't see and young children and young people can't actually see that what they've said has made a difference, then you know. Why bother? So sure. we need to ensure that 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 they see action from what they've done. Sure. So what about the um, children that sometimes are hard to reach? Um, what plans are being developed for those uh, children that you know they don't always engage in with authorities, but may have a mental health issue? So um, prior to the the pandemic, if you can remember back to the. <laughs> Um, you, you you may remember that uh, Dame Dr Denise Coya mm -hmm. uh, chaired the Children and Young People's Task Force and mm -hmm. delivered a set of recommendations to Scottish Government, which we accepted, and we uh, were very grateful to that that task force for doing that. And there there were children and young people's voices around that table, which was really important. In fact, it was co-chaired by a young person. A young person. Yes. Um, and from that, one of the recommendations was that we deliver enhanced community mental health and wellbeing services for five to 25 year olds um, and their, their families and the carers and their carers. Mm -hmm. And we have been working very closely with our local authority colleagues um, to develop those services. And the services that will have a focus on prevention and early intervention. Um, and the, the framework that the local authorities are working to specifically highlights the need for, for promotion of positive mental health and wellbeing, which focuses on esteem and on, on body image. So the, the majority of those services are expected to be in place um, in the uh, coming months. Mm -hmm. um, we allocated 3.75 million pounds in, in this year's budget specifically to fund those. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a further 15 million pounds is expected to be in place in 2021, 22 mm -hmm. to support those, those services, which will be local services. And mm -hmm. the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health um, announced just a couple of weeks ago now, additional funding for local authorities mm -hmm. um, I think it was something in in the in the figure of about eleven million pounds, um, to help support them, uh, help them to support children and young people specifically in response to the pandemic, recognising the additional needs and resources that were needed there. So the, this the 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 service that is that is being set up is is very much a a, a service to look at. I suppose I, in my mind, I look at it as a layering, a layering approach to, mm -hmm. to children and young people's mental health. So we have CAM services, which are absolutely vital for, for some children and young people if they're in particular need of those specialist services. But we recognise that, the, that there needs to be other services too, that mm -hmm. not all children and young people need that highly specialist intervention. So those, those services form another part of that layer the school counsellors, the additional training for teachers in mental health and mental health support, and in fact, the, the, the rollout of, of mental health uh, training to all school staff, because you recognise it's not just teachers who interact with children and young people, and also the, um, the additional school nurses that are being mm -hmm. trained. Um, so 
all of that gives a, a, a layering effect for, for different levels of intervention and need that, are, that are needed and also provide the opportunity for early intervention. Mm -hmm. Because for, you know, obviously, if you if you can intervene earlier and prevent yes. problems from developing, that's much better. That's not to say that that we will not need CAM services because we absolutely will. Because some some children mm -hmm. and young will just need that level of intervention and support mm -hmm. because they become unwell. Mm -hmm. But yes, I absolutely agree. Early intervention um, can save a lot of uh, distress and a lot of uh, work and, and later on. Um, it's always a challenge to, to meet demand. As a GP, I, I know that. It's hard to keep up and um, provide everything that our patients need. Um, so how are mental health services going to be supported to cope with the growing demand that we're expecting on their services? So obviously through the, the launch of the transition in recovery plan, we've, we've acknowledged, acknowledged some of the areas that we, mm -hmm. we are looking to target and, and, and to enhance and, and, and support mental health and well-being right across um, the spectrum from tackling stigma right through to specialist inpatient services. Um, and over the pandemic, we've provided um, 1.1 1 .1 billion pounds for mm -hmm. NHS boards and integrated authorities to meet the costs of responding to the pandemic. Um, and there was funding for additional mental health costs included in that money. And we expect that to be used to to meet the pressures and respond to the needs of children and young people who need specialist services. Um, as I said earlier, we recognise not everyone, uh, not all children and young people will need access to, to CAM services. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are looking at en enhancing and supporting local authorities to support mental wellbeing for five to 24 year olds in, in their communities and mm -hmm. will continue to invest in and other measures to support children and young people's mental well-being and that includes enhanced digital resources on mental health and well-being as I said via Young Scott, um, the, the Distress Brief Intervention Programme and supporting various organisations and charities through, as, as, through the community's funding um, that's, been, um, that's been distributed through as a, a, on an annual basis but also additional funding that's been provided through the pandemic, things like um, additional monies for um, some of the uh, uh, parenting support services that are out there, Aberlour, mm -hmm. Everett Childline had additional um, monies to help them uh, respond to the increase in, in telephone calls that they were receiving. Um, the Spark Counselling Service received additional monies to help support relationships. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, if parental relationships are, are strained mm -hmm. then that can have an impact on children and young people's health and well-being so there's there's a broad spectrum of of work um, being supported which might not specifically be seen traditionally as mental health services because sometimes I think we look at those as being NHS mm -hmm. services that, but actually third sector partners play a key part in supporting families children and young people right across the country and quite frankly you know keep keep people alive at times if you think of mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. like the Samaritans and so on yeah, who, who support people in distress so so there's there are lots and lots of organizations out there helping to support the mental health and well-being of of all society but particularly children and young people thank you Claire so, so the next question brings up um, another point about the transition and recovery plan mm -hmm. um, and it asks, um, it says that one of the points in the plan was on the culture that's been created where young people constantly compare themselves with their peers as well as celebrities. Mm -hmm. This has been heightened by the reach and prevalence of social media. In your opinion, could and should there be more emphasis on, uh, on the tech giants to help contribute towards a rebalancing of this culture and pushing body positivity into the mainstream? I think everyone bears some responsibility to support young people's access mm -hmm. to social media in, in a safe and healthy way, um, to be quite honest. From, from the, the work that, that we were doing pre-pandemic on, on yeah healthy use of social media young people consistently said that they that they felt social media and screen time can have a negative effect on their mental health and um 
we seen to, we saw some research about sleep and the importance of sleep and how interrupted sleep can be and and, and the impact that that can have on on your mental health as well as your, as well as your physical health. So so last year we announced we would be producing advice specific to Scotland mm -hmm. uh, on the healthy use of social media and screen time. And the advice uh, called Mind, Mind Your Time, I think I mentioned mm -hmm. it earlier, was co-produced by young people for young people and published in the spring. And that's available on the Mind Your Time and Scottish Youth Parliament website. And I would encourage anyone on the call who hasn't looked at it to go and have a look at it. Um, I think it's, it's, it is also, social media can, can, can be, um, can be used for the good as well as 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 for the detrimental sure. um, and I think we we need to recognize as well that that there is a lot of good can come out of it mm -hmm. but like everything we 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 you need to provide people with the tools to recognize when that's having an impact on them that is not a good one mm -hmm. and the resources to then reach out and access some some help and assistance and some guidance and that mm -hmm. might as as simple as a chat with with a with an adult or with a peer about this is affecting me like this. What do I do about it? Mm -hmm. How can I how can I feel that um, feel better about myself and mm -hmm. not let this have an impact on me? Mm -hmm. So it, it is it is challenging and it's complex and you know. I guess the tech giants they feel so. Um distant sometimes and so enormous organizations and things like that it's hard to know sometimes how you might influence that um but i certainly think it's quite important that they have uh, some responsibility um yeah and, I, and and we've maybe seen in recent weeks with the mm. american election mm. organizations like twitter have have yeah. started to intervene in a way that they didn't before in mm -hmm. terms of challenging some of the um, untruths, as they would put it, or un unsubstantiated claims, I think that's mm -hmm. how, how, how they put it under under certain certain people's tweets. Um, and so, hopefully, we've we've started to see the door open a little bit on that mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of of being um, as socially responsible as we would want everyone to be. And I'm trying to be very diplomatic. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, I, yeah, I think I think we 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 all need to to challenge some of yeah. the things that sometimes we see on social media. Sure. So there's a question, Claire, that's come in on the the um, chat um, mm -hmm. from Linda Thompson um, that that might link up with this a bit, and it's about discussing the uh, role of commercial platforms like OnlyFans and Admire Me Women which encouraged the um, sale and exchanging of sexual and explicit content. And we've seen a surge in uh, young women signing up, particularly students, and many, well, many young women have spoken about the pressure to sign up to a profile, promote it via their social media, and start creating um, uh, sexual content. How can we address these sites who are making a huge profit um, from the objectification of women? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not familiar with those, those platforms. Me um, I have to say, um, and I, given what you've told me, I'm probably quite reluctant to go on and try and, <laughs> and, 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 and do some research. But I, do you know, it's my colleague Ash Denham, um, who is the communities, uh, community justice minister, oh. has been doing a lot of work on sexual exploitation of women uh -huh. and um, looking at uh, the um, sex industry as, as a as a broader as a broader yeah. term and how and, and looking at the the possibility of changing some of the laws round about round about the sex sex trade and sex workers and so yeah. on. Um, I think it it's certainly it's certainly an area that 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 causes me huge concern and cause, mm. certainly causes her concern. Um, I can certainly provide, uh, or, or the officials in the call can provide uh, Linda. I think was was it Linda? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, provide Linda with some of uh, some uh, information on the work that Scottish government is doing in that area. But yeah, that certainly causes it causes me concern. N not not as a Scottish government minister alone, but as as a woman that yes, absolutely are being 
exploited in that way sure. um, and you know I think it was it last year or the year before there was there were lots of reporting about um, landlords advertising yes. for tenants um, in exchange for sex I think it was Craigslist was the was the um, the website that was being used um, and we you know the, the exploitation of women in, in any manner, shape, or form is just absolutely not acceptable. Um, yeah. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we're just nearly finishing time, Claire. So I just want to just check that we um, there's a point up here uh, that I was asked to bring up. <clears throat> um, so I think it's going back to schools, and I think it's about um, the, the uh, support that schools can provide for mental health. But the concern that there's a huge deficit in schools budgets um, and this is another topic that adds to the pressure on schools um, how would you respond to that that there's a huge deficit in schools budgets budgets and okay. we've just added mental health as another um, issue and body positivity that they have to deal with uh -huh. how do they balance all that i mean as i referred to so the Gerfic earlier on in schools, yeah. like everyone else who interacts with children and young people, have a responsibility to promote a, a children's health and well-being in in all of their interactions with with children. And, and I appreciate that there are budgetary challenges everywhere, mm -hmm. right, right, right across yeah. um, all areas of Scottish government. We have a financial envelope that we have to work within, and as do local authorities. Um, Dealing with children and young people with care and compassion costs nothing. Mm -hmm. um, opening your ears and listening to a child costs nothing. Mm -hmm. And our teachers and, and those who work in schools are professionals and, and work in that area because they're passionate about children's well-being and education and nurturing children yeah, in the true. fullest sense of, of, of the word, whether that. So um, they are ideally placed to be to support our children as they do day in day out sure. um, and so the you know we see lots of innovation in schools that don't necessarily cost a lot of money but in, in addition as, in, as I was saying we, we are putting in additional resources into schools in terms of mental health training school counsellors school nurses to help to support ch the teachers in our schools to provide us healthy and as nurturing an environment as we can for our young people. And Claire, the last question, because we're nearly out of time, um, that um, the current waiting lists are quite long for children and young people for mental health services. And with the reduction of face-to-face -face services adding to the wave of mental health issues facing young people, this is going to be a real challenge. Um, can, you know, uh, can you acknowledge that waiting lists are, are actually increasing despite all the things that we've talked about and all the things that you've put in place? I mean, I, do you know, I, I absolutely accept that, that waiting lists for children and young people are too long. I've done that in Parliament. I've apologised for it in Parliament. Mm. And we're, we're working very closely and intensively with health boards and integrated joint boards throughout Scotland to look at how we can assist them to... Um, provide services in in a in a more um, timious way in um, tackling the waiting lists in more innovative ways, but also looking at how we can support them to perhaps change some of the structures of how services are delivered. There are some absolutely um, shiny examples of services, and obviously here we're talking about CAM services so yes. that. Um, that that have worked really hard over the pandemic to reduce their, their waiting times right down. And NHS Grampian is one of them. So we're looking at, at taking the learning from there okay, and, good. and, and uh, in trying to um, disseminate that right across as, as best practice right across health boards. I also know that health boards such as Glasgow um, mm -hmm. through, the, through the pandemic, when, when they're waiting, when they're um, referral, uh, yeah referrals went down were tackling their longest wait so they were actually prioritizing people who were the, uh, who were waiting longest on their waiting list okay. to bring down that that waiting list time so yes there's there are challenges there okay. additional services that are coming on stream will okay. assist because okay. we will have early intervention and there will be alternatives for people to go to rather than than a, a cam service 
but we also acknowledge that we need to do work from from that end of of, mm -hmm. of the spectrum too so yeah. that work's ongoing and a lot of that is highlighted in the transition and recovery plan thank you claire it's been really interesting uh, speaking to you this afternoon and i'm going to hand back now to claire hunter from red harbour but thank you for your time today. Well, thank you, Moira, and thank you to everyone who's submitted a question. I think it's been it's been a really interesting discussion. I certainly uh, I hope that people um, have have heard of how passionate I am about children and young people's mental health, mm -hmm. um, and and how determined we are in Scottish government to ensure that we we have a healthy nation. Sure. Thank you, Claire. Thank you both very much. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to that. I thought it was um, answered a lot of questions. Um, I think we got through a lot. And as we said, if there's anything that you do want um, further answer on, if you could email info at redharbour.org. So um, it just leaves me to say a warm thank you to both Claire Hoy and um, Moira McKenna from Girl Guiding Scotland. And um, we hope to welcome you again to another Red Harbour event. This was a precursor to a body image and mental health event that we're holding in December. So um, more information will be sent out on that. So thank you once again. Goodbye. Bye.